Hello, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to uh, take a few moments and talk about an important subject that a lot of folks inside of the church don't want to address today. Jesus gives us some warnings that we need to pay attention to. In fact, the Word of God gives us several things that we need to watch for in the latter days. In Matthew 24, we're told that the disciples came to Jesus asking him, What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Well, Jesus answered them and said, To take heed that no man deceives you, that many are going to come in his name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many people. Not might deceive, will deceive many people. And we're told by Jesus, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there will arise false Christs and false prophets. My friends, we need to be aware of the fact that false pri uh, Christ, false prophets, false teachers will arise. And it's one of the great signs of the last days. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord tells us to come now and let us reason together. So let's do just that. Let's try to talk about this calmly and really rely on the Word of God to guide us. I want to talk about what is a believer's source of truth. Also, what must we do in order to be saved? And how do we avoid being deceived by some of these false teachers, false prophets, and false Christs? So, first of all, what is to be a believer's source of truth? Well, in John 17, Jesus tells us, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So, a believer's source of truth is to be God's Word, taken in correct context and not compromised. Romans 10 verse 17 tells us, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. In John 14, Jesus says, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. So a believer's source of truth is the Word of God. Let's talk about the relevance of believing God's Word and having faith in the Jesus found in God's Word and holding to the hope that Jesus has done and will do everything that God's Word tells us He has done and promises that He will do in the future. In John 3.16, we are told, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life with Jesus in heaven. So believing in the one true Jesus is absolutely essential. This is the Greek word which is translated believe. In Webster's 1828 Dictionary, it defines believe as meaning thoroughly abide in. So we are to thoroughly abide in Jesus Christ. Strong's Concordance translates this word as put one's trust in. So we are to thoroughly abide in, thoroughly put our trust in the Jesus Christ found in God's Word. So to believe in Jesus Christ is to thoroughly trust in Him. Thoroughly trusting in Jesus Christ, the one found in God's Word, is what believers do. It's who we are. In fact, believing in Jesus is what separates believers from the non-believing world. From 1 Peter 1, we're told, Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Well, the words faith and hope are very closely related to the world word belief. The Greek word for faith means trustworthy. The word for hope means trust. So we are to thoroughly put our trust in and have faith and hope, which mean trust, in Jesus. The book of Psalms in 71, we're told, For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. When we place our faith and our hope in Jesus, we thoroughly trust in Jesus. That is, we believe in the biblical Christ. In John 1, we're told, In the beginning was the Word, 
and all things were made by him. So the word of God is our creator. The creator is the word of God. In John 1, we're told that the word, the creator, was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the word of God, our creator, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To thoroughly believe in Jesus is important to believe he is who he says he is. In Exodus 20, verse 11, in the middle of the Ten Commandments, etched in the stone by God's very own finger, we're told, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. I think this is such an important issue, and God knew it would be in the latter days, that he actually etched in the stone the creation account in the middle of his Ten Commandments when he's talking about the seventh and Sabbath day of rest. From Proverbs 9 we're told, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. But rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. My friends, condemnation comes from Satan. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Keep this in mind as we reason together and go through this. The biblical Jesus Christ is first our creator. He is also our Savior, who died on a cross, taking on our punishment for our sin, and rose again the third day to defeat death. He now sits on the right hand of the Father. It's most relevant to believe God's word, to put our faith in the Jesus Christ found in God's word. So what must we do to be saved? Well, from 1 Timothy 4, we're told we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe, those that thoroughly trust and, and abide in in Jesus Christ. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Jesus. You know, Satan is the father of lies. In fact, Jesus tells us in, in Matthew 13, the enemy that sowed the lies is the devil, and the harvest will be the end of the world. In uh, Matthew 7, Jesus tells us, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into heaven. Many will say to Jesus on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works in your name? Perhaps we've uh, wrote a best-selling book that was bought by millions of Christians, or maybe uh, thousands of churches use their book or their study uh, in one of their home school or home study groups. Or perhaps they wrote a best-selling song that was sung in churches and 10,000 people would go to their concerts. But that is not what tells us that we're a true believer. We have to go by what a person says. Does it match the word of God? Many will come to Jesus on that day saying, Lord, Lord, I've done these works. And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me ye that work in equity. So how do we avoid being deceived? You now the problem with being deceived is that we don't know if we're deceived. Well, Jesus tells us in John 5 to search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they, the scriptures, are they which testify of Jesus. We have to make sure what we hear, what we're taught, what we believe is in line with with the Word of God, so that we're believing in the one true Jesus and not a false Christ. In Acts 17, we're told to be like the Bereans, who receive the Word with all readiness of mind and search the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. We need to be like the Bereans and compare what we believe and what we're told and what we hear to the Word of God to make sure that we are in line with God's Word. We must examine what we believe in the light of that word. 2 Corinthians 13 tells us to examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. We need to prove ourselves to ourselves by reading God's word and making sure we're in line with God's word. From Ephesians 2, For by grace you are saved through faith, by thoroughly abiding in Jesus and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. 
It was 1963 that the United States of America allowed biblical prayer and biblical creation to be removed from their schools and replaced with the foundations of secular humanism, billions of years of time, and Darwinian evolution, two different beliefs. In 1 Corinthians, we're told by Jesus, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We are to put our faith in God, not secular interpretations of God's creation. Unfortunately, today about 90% of accredited Christian colleges and seminaries teach secular-based Old Earth philosophies and beliefs which put death before Adam, undermining the fact that Adam's sin brought death into the world while separating us from Jesus and requiring our redemption with him. Death before Adam undermines the true gospel message. And if Old Earth beliefs are a problem for you, please watch our Old Earth or a Global Flood message. I think it will help you greatly. From 1 Timothy, we're told, Teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. We're not to give heed to fairy tales and endless genealogies, which minister to questions rather than godly edifying. But unfortunately today, billions of years beliefs, putting death and suffering before Adam, and even Darwinian evolutionism, are deeply ingrained within the Christian church. It has led to much compromise within the Christian communities of God's word and who our creator and savior is. From Colossians 2 verse 8, Jesus tells us, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beware of secular man-made philosophies that don't match up with Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ found in Scripture. Unfortunately, studies reveal that the majority of today's pastors and Christian adults hold to a secular worldview, usually being focused around the billions of years beliefs which have inundated the church today. Here's an email I got from a pastor who holds to that secular based view. He says, Russ, when I look around at the mountains and canyons, I have to conclude the earth is billions of years old. You just can't believe in a literal six day creation. My friends, you most certainly can believe in a literal six day creation, which is described clearly in and throughout the Bible. Uh, again, my message in Old Earth or a Global Flood will greatly help anyone who struggles with that area. But saying that God couldn't do what he claims to have done undermines people's hope, their faith, and their belief. From 2 Timothy 4, preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We are to use the word of God to teach the word of God. And we're to do this with all long suffering. It, sometimes that is not easy to do. We're all in the flesh and we all make mistakes. We have that struggle between the spirit side and the flesh side, but we do the best that we can to help each other. Rebuking each other is not yelling and screaming at each other. Uh, we reprove, we rebuke, we help each other, we guide each other. Iron sharpens iron. From 2 Timothy 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned to fables. The Bible says that people will seek out teachers that will teach their itching ears what they want to hear rather than what the truth really is, and they'll believe in fables and be led astray. The lack of faith that God's word is authoritative and reliable for guiding our lives today in the institutionalized church, and the lack of hope that God is the creator and judge he claims to be, has allowed false Christs and false teachers, false prophets, to become deeply ingrained in today's church institution. From Acts 20, also of your own selves from within the Christian ranks, shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Today, many Christians opt to believe in various man-made versions of Christ. The fact that there's more than one should tell us that there is a problem. 
from Hebrews 11. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. He must thoroughly trust and abide in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Saying God isn't who he claims to be undermines people's hope, their faith, and their belief. From Second Peter 2, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. This isn't saying there might be false teachers. This says there will be false teachers among us, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord Jesus. Let's look at some characteristics of these false teachers, false prophets. Number one, they're going to be dressed as sheep among us. They may speak the best Christianese you ever heard. They may sound like the most charismatic, perfect Christian you've ever seen. How do you tell a false prophet from a real prophet? Jesus says, beware of false prophets. When I say prophet, I'm really meaning teacher. Which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. Well, they're going to promote false teachings. So the way you tell a false prophet or false teacher from a true teacher is they're going to be uh, teaching you things that don't line up with God's word. If they say, well, God's word is a, a non-essential or that uh, God's word really doesn't mean what it's saying here, uh, maybe the people in those days didn't understand it, so God had to, what, mislead them. That is a false teaching. If their teachings don't line up with God's word, then they are a false teacher, a false prophet. And another characteristic of these false prophets is that they just may perform great signs and miracles. They may have a best-selling book that sold millions of copies. They may have a, a number one hit movie or a number one hit Christian song or whatever. They might perform great signs and wonders, but if their teachings don't line up with the Word of God, they're a false teacher. Jesus told us in Mark 13, for false Christs and false prophets will rise. It's going to happen and will show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. And these false prophets are going to lead people to follow a non-biblical form of Christ. If they're promoting a form of Christ who is not in line with the biblical Christ, they're a false prophet. From Matthew 24, Jesus said, Many false prophets will rise, shall rise, and deceive many. It's going to happen, folks. In fact, it's already and has always been happening. Now, attempting to alter God's word to fit secular beliefs, today people are making images of Christ that are not found in Scripture. And they're denying Jesus is the Creator who created in six days and rested on the seventh. And the judge who judged man's sin once already with a flood of waters that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. That, my friends, is a global flood. They're denying Jesus is the creator and judge he claims to be. Back to the book of Exodus and the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, again etched into stone by God's very own finger, is that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or in the earth beneath. We are not to worship any other god, and we're not to make up false gods, false images, and worship them. Those are the first two of the Ten Commandments. Characteristics of false Christ include, they're not going to be the creator or the judge described in God's word. If they don't match the Jesus Christ who is there at the beginning, who is our creator, that's a false Christ. They're going to try to mesh secular teachings into God's word, and it's always at the expense of God's word. They always bend God's word to fit with secular interpretations of the world. The first five words of scripture are that in the beginning, God created. Theistic evolutionists, of which I formerly was one, worship a Christ who used billions of years of death to gradually evolve all life forms, ending with mankind. But Jesus tells us in Mark 10 that 
from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Jesus says man was made in the beginning, not at the end. Progressive creationists worship uh, Christ who used billions of years of death to gradually create all life forms, ending with man. But in Matthew 19, Jesus says, He which made them at the beginning made them male and female. The biblical message is man's sin. Man was made in the beginning, and his sin corrupted the creation, allowing death and evil to enter while separating us from God and requiring Jesus' death on the cross to redeem us with our loving Creator. Theistic evolutionists and progressive creationists deny God created the universe in six days or that he judged sin with a global flood that laid down the earth's strata layers. The old earth beliefs are based on the strata forming slowly, so they must deny the global flood. Now, most theistic evolutionists and progressive creationists don't even know that. So again, see our old earth global flood teaching, and it will really straighten you out on these issues. Think about this. In 2 Peter 3, we're told that in the last days, scoffers will come. This is an end-time prophecy. And they're going to be willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. It's foretold that in the last days, people will deny the global flood. Why deny the global flood? Because it wipes out the old earth beliefs. Wheaton College teaches progressive creation. This Wheaton professor said, think about what he says here, Genesis without considerations suggested by science. In other words, the Word of God without considerations uh, based on secular interpretations of the world is that God created the heavens and the earth in six solar days and that man was created on the sixth day. That is what the pure, uncompromised Word of God tells us. In 2 Timothy 3, we're told, In the last days perilous times shall come, for men will be lovers of their own selves, of their own knowledge, covetous, boasters, proud. There's a list of things, and that list ends with, these people will have a form of godliness. They're not going to say they're atheists. They're, not going, to, they're going to actually say that they believe in God, but they're going to deny the power of him. For instance, Oh, I believe in, in God, but he couldn't have created in six days or judged the world with a global flood. They're going to claim to have a form of God, but deny his power. The verse ends with, from such, turn away. Back to the characteristics of these false Christs. They're, again, they'll appear to mesh secular teachings into God's word, making God's word bend to fit the secular beliefs and they will not be the creator or judge described in the word of God. And because of this, they're going to mislead people, being preferred by many who have itching ears and want to uh, kind of ride the fence between secularism and, and the biblical view. Uh, they're going to mislead people, being preferred over the one true Christ, the Christ found in the word of God. From 2 Corinthians 11, If he that comes preaches another Jesus... Or if ye shall receive another spirit or another gospel, you might bear with him. In other words, we need to be on the lookout for false Jesuses, false Christs, different spirits, and different tweaked gospels. It is not the gospel found in God's word. For such who push these things are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, which they are not. And this should be of no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Here's an email I received from a theistic evolutionist. I'm a college-educated Christian and a firm believer that creation is nonsense. Face it, man evolved over long ages of time, and there was never an Adam or an Eve. To follow such ideas is to dilute oneself. Well, first of all, that is what the Bible says. This man is calls himself a Christian, but the problem is he's obviously been misled to not believe the Word of God. Now, to these compromised positions that the church was trying to fit uh, into the Bible in the 1800s, really the mid to late 1800s, 
trying to fit Melanie Zavir's belief is in the God's word. Thomas Huxley, known as Darwin's bulldog, stated that the position they, the church, have taken up is hopelessly untenable. Then reading from 1 Corinthians 15, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Then Huxley astutely asked this rhetorical question. If Adam may be held to be no more a real personage than Prometheus, what value has Paul's dialectic? And the obvious answer is there is no value in Paul's message if there was never an Adam, a real literal Adam, who, who caused and uh, committed the original literal sin of mankind, which brought on the curse and the death and separated us from God, requiring our redemption with God through our Lord and Savior's sacrifice, that being the Jesus Christ found in Scripture. Two Calvin College professors, Calvin College pushes theistic evolution, stated that they no longer believe there was ever an Adam or an Eve. They say we know this because evolution has taught us. Well, see our 50 facts versus Darwinism in the textbooks if Darwinism is a problem for you. It'll explain a lot of things and show a lot of frauds they use to fool people like these two Calvin College professors. But what they figured out is that uh, they're teaching that death existed before Adam. Any old earth belief puts death before Adam. So they can't teach Adam's sin brought in death, separating us from God, requiring our redemption with God. So to try to get over that problem, they're just saying, hey, you know what? There never really was an Adam or Eve. My friends, we need to humble ourselves to God's word. We need to thoroughly abide in him, to thoroughly trust in him, to believe in him. Galatians 1 tells us, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, a different gospel, which is not another. You see, it's not a totally different gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In other words, there are going to be very similar gospels, but they're twisted, they're tweaked, they are perverted gospels, and they're going to mislead people. Uh, Galatians goes on, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that that you have received, let him be accursed. John Piper astutely stated, Submission to Christ without submission to the Scriptures is submission to a self-made Christ, not submission to Christ. In other words, if you make up a different Jesus than the one that is found in Scripture, you're not submitting to Christ. You're submitting to a man-made, a self-made version of Christ, a false Christ. You're not submitting to the Jesus Christ who created you and who died on a cross in your place and rose again and now sits on the right hand of the Father. We need to make sure that who we trust, who we believe, who we put our eternal hope into, is the Jesus found in God's Word. From 2 Timothy 3, Now as John's and Jambres withstood Moses, withstood who? Moses, who told us of the biblical creation and of the global flood. So do these resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Yet Christianity today asks Christians to stop attacking Darwinian evolution which is teaching children they evolved without God, to start supporting the intelligent design movement, which is not a Christian movement, although many Christians are involved in it. I believe in intelligent design. Any Christian believes in intelligent design. But realize, we need to credit it to our intelligent biblical creator. The ID movement, you could be a Hindu or a Buddhist or a New Ager, and you also are fine with the ID movement. It's not a Christian movement. You'll just uh, give the credit for the design to whatever deity you believe in. And then Christianity Today urged their readers to begin attacking young earth creationists. I don't like the term young earth creationists, but I'm stuck with it. It's, it's a believer. Those, to start attacking those who believe in a perfect creation corrupted by sin that separated us from God and that was judged with a worldwide flood. Here's an email I received from another secular Christian. 
As a Christian with a college degree, I can't believe the claims you make about the age of the earth. You're a complete embarrassment to Christianity. Well, my friends, I just show people that God's word is true and it trumps secular interpretations of the world. I'm sorry, we just can't blend them both together because death before Adam undermines the gospel message. From 2 Peter 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Hey, if you're going to stand on the truth of God's word, some people are just not going to like it. It's just the way that it is. And it always has been. Here's another email I received from another secular Christian. I'm horribly enraged by you. There are flaws in the Bible, especially with creation and the flood. In other words, they believe in old earth beliefs. He goes on. You have no right to tell people your horribly uneducated opinion as you spew garbage from your mouth. So this self-prescribing Christian, describing Christian, I should say, uh, calls it spewing garbage from your mouth when you show people God's word is true? Hmm. I email back. Speaking of horribly uneducated opinions, thanks for your email. Your hate-filled message failed to point out any flaws in the Bible. I suggest you put your faith in God's word rather than in man's ever-changing philosophies. Jesus said, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. And that's a shame, because it is so simple to stay on that narrow path that leads to that straight gate. You read God's word, and you put your faith in the word of God. Here's an email I received from a pastor in Colorado. Russ, the local high school is a staunch promoter of an old earth and Darwinism, as all public schools and colleges are. They've misled many Christian kids. In fact, studies say that 85 to 90 percent of Christian raised kids are now leaving the church by the age of 20. These studies also say that about one out of three of those do come back to church when they're in their 30s. But it's not because they suddenly believe in Jesus, it's because they want help raising their family with some sort of moral background. Well, you might say, well, at least they're coming back, but unfortunately that they're coming back with secular worldviews and filling the church with secular believing individuals. It's a tough position that we're in today. For instance, Charles Templeton was a pastor and an evangelist. Back in the 1950s, he was more popular than Billy Graham. He had his own television show called Look Up and Live. Then he became convinced the earth was millions and billions of years old, putting death before Adam, and he lost his faith and spent the rest of his life as an outspoken atheist. Michael Shermer is a good example. He went off to college wanting to be a pastor but lost his faith. He has served as the director of the Skeptic Society, editor of Skeptic Magazine, and has written several anti-Christian books, one of which was Why Darwin Matters. Let's go back and finish that email from the pastor in Colorado. He said, at a citywide pastor's meeting, when I announced my intention to bring you in to refute Darwinism and old earth beliefs, the other pastors stood up and walked out of the meeting. Hmm. You know, in John 12, we're told, among the chief rulers, many believed on Jesus, but they did not confess him, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. We're losing 90% of our kids by the age of 20. And these pastors aren't standing up on God's word because they don't want to be seen as out of step with secular interpretations of the world. And preferring the praise of men over the truth of Christ, they block this information. I have a book called The Submerging Church where I give many of my personal anecdotes that reveal the depth of the problem, but I also give practical solutions for Christians at all levels, from students to parents to Sunday school teachers to youth pastors and senior pastors. There are answers to these issues, but we have to address and stand on the truth. From Acts 20, we're told, After my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. This leads to what I call the Christian industry. Now this is aimed, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States of America alone. 
It's aimed at uh, young Christians and at seekers, uh, folks who really don't know the Word of God very well. Success is measured in worldly terms, such as head counts, how many people were there, and how much money is being brought in. Soul winning and biblical knowledge has been left out, left behind, abandoned. From Romans 10, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Today, people want salvation, but they don't necessarily want the biblical Jesus. Worship is oftentimes me-centered. Music reflects how we feel about ourselves or our situations. Messages teach how we can feel good about ourselves. Biblical creation, the age of the earth, sin, personal responsibility, and Jesus' shed blood on the cross are usually left out. This church is lukewarm, and they're loving it. Jesus told us in Mark 7, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. It's vain to worship Jesus if you're going to take the commandments of men, secular-based philosophies over the word of Christ. So, who Jesus is has become a non-essential to the lukewarm church. Jesus tells us in Revelation 3, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the beginning of the creation of God. First, to the lukewarm church, Jesus has the angel introduce him as the Creator. Are they going to be denying that he's the Creator in the latter days? Back to Revelation 3. Jesus said to the lukewarm church, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. Because thou art lukewarm and not cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. When your Savior warns he will, he will vomit you from his mouth, that might want to wake us up to the seriousness of worshiping the one true Christ. My friends, God's word leaves no doubt that Jesus Christ is our creator, our savior, and our loving God. He only asks that we believe in him, that we trust in him, that we thoroughly abide in him, in the Jesus found in his word. From Proverbs 9, verse 8, once again, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Again, my friends, condemnation comes from Satan. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. From Hebrews 3, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Do not depart from the living God. If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. This is a problem for all of us. It was a problem for Jesus' disciples. Think about this. Jesus tells us in Mark 6 regarding his disciples. When they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they didn't even consider the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. They had seen Jesus feed thousands with just a few loaves of bread, but when they then saw him walking on the water, they didn't think he could do such, and that it must be an evil spirit. Their hearts were hardened. Jesus tells us again in Revelation 3, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Jesus will rebuke us and chasten us. He will fine-tune us to keep us on that narrow path that leads to eternity with him in heaven. So be zealous and repent. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's talking about this lukewarm church again, and they've closed the door on him. He's outside of the church. He's knocking on the door. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne in heaven for eternity with Christ. We can open the door for the one true Christ. He's found in God's non-compromised word. In John 5, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. We are to believe in the word of God, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. 
Teaching God's uncompromised word strengthens people's hope that God is who he claims to be. It strengthens their faith that God will do what he has promised to do, and it enforces their belief in the one and only Lord Jesus Christ, the one found in God's non-compromised word. In Mark 1, Jesus says, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Some have a zeal for God, but they don't have a base for their faith in his word. Many people blindly trust false teachers who teach them what they want to hear. And they don't read the word of God, so if you don't read God's word, you won't know when you're being misled. Are you betting your eternal destiny on the one true Christ who is found in God's pure word? Or on some various non-biblical Jesus who is based on the wisdom and philosophies of fallible man? The only way to be redeemed with God is by repenting of our sins and believing in the one and only Jesus Christ found in God's non-compromised word. Such belief is the only way to receive spiritual and eternal life. So my friends, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. My friends, read God's word, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, and put your faith in the word of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.